Thank you. Good to see you, Armandy. Okay, let's begin. We're five minutes late. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. This is day one of the summit. This is kind of overview territory today. Um, we have had an overwhelming response again to this summit. We run it about four times a year and we open up the program four times a year. So we've had an overwhelming response to this as well. Um, and it was pretty low key summit's introduction. And I think we've something like 400 people signed up for it. So isn't that incredible, the demand? I know it is incredible. Um, it's lovely to see all the new faces, I have to say, um, really lovely, and it's lovely to see all the old faces, you know what I mean by old, don't you, and that's so old, Fidelma, right, nice, and that right, Breda, not so old, but familiar, so there's some amazing um, people in here, um, in this group, who are in practice with this, who have been at the other end of the treatment of anxiety um, through this model, who will may or may not, it's, it's, not uh, it's not designed this way, who may or may not add their voice as we move through this. Um, and it just gives it that wee bit of authenticity and, instead of me delivering something. And I, so I would encourage those of you that have, have had treatment under this model to use your voice. Um, because it'll think those that are listening, it'll give some clarity to that. I'm not telling you now, all right, Fidelma, just encouraging you in a lovely person-centered way. Anyhow, let's get to the introductions. Some of you have signed up for this, right? And you have never met me. You have no idea who I am. You have no idea what you're coming to or what this is about. So let, give me two seconds just to introduce me. Um, um, this isn't the Shauna show, um, but it's helpful, I think, if I give you an idea of who I am, so that so that you can be assured that the information that I'm giving you comes from a really solid place, so that you can be assured that the information that I am about to share for these next five days is uh, not only authentic, but has some excellent clinical outcomes and has other people in practice other than just my word. So my name's Shauna Quigley, and I'm the founder of a company called The Clear Method. Clear Method is a uh, psychotherapeutic tool for uh, healing core wounds, finding and healing core wounds. And this, what I'm about to share with you today, is a part of our overall programs. There's three programs in total, what we call Emotional Mastery, this, which is what we call Anxiety and Panic Program, and then The Clearing Program. And these three programs I have um, devised and um, researched and developed and trained um, myself through a long, 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 long journey with trauma and transforming trauma. I'm not going to bore you with the detail of that because you're not here for me, you're here for you. But if anybody's interested, then there's a head talk on that. And there's lots of interviews. Um, across the internet where I'm being interviewed by other people about that. So I'd encourage you. And the podcast as well, brilliant for um, other people's stories of transformation through these methods. So that's enough, hopefully, about me. The one last thing that I will say is that I'm also a qualified person-centered psychotherapist on top of it. So not only is this model being developed by me through my own understanding of trauma, but I'm also I went back to train um, I went back to train as a psychotherapist in order to ensure that I, that I had enough uh, stability in order to deliver these programs. Hopefully that's enough. We tiny bit of housekeeping. Everything is recorded and everything is on the replay for recording. Um, there is a note pack that goes with this. So if I share anything on screen, there is a note pack uh, that you can download for free completely in order to aid your process. So whatever I share, we will ensure that it uh, correlates with a note pack. You don't have to download the note pack. It's fine if you don't have it, so nobody panic. But if you wanted it, um, the link should be on your email so you can access it after this if you want it. All you have to do is sign up for sign under the Teachable uh, Academy and you should be able to download it there and then. Uh, we will be sharing quite a bit of information. So you might want a pen and you might want to um, 
you might want a pen and a piece of paper that would be brilliant um, I'm going to rattle through it as quick as I can. If you have any questions, then please use the chat. Um, that would be brilliant. Um, thank you, Bev. Thanks for that. Um, so if you have any questions, just use the chat. Um, that would be brilliant. If you have anything that you'd like to ask or add, especially the guys that have been through the program, then um, just let me know in the chat and we, and we can open that up to you. Does that feel okay? Does everybody feel all right with that? Okay, right, so we're now 10 minutes. We've done an introduction and we've let everybody in. So we're not doing too bad. I always ask this at the beginning of every training. How's the accent? Am I too fast? Am I all right? All right, Michelle. Michelle's nodding and laughing. Um, I think what we should do prior to any of these trainings is that we should put people through a few Dairy Girl episodes so that when they come up against me, then when I'm live, then they're all right to get the, so I'll try and slow it down. I tend to get really, really passionate and I can, I can get quick, I can get really fast. So if, if you want, if you think I'm too fast, then please encourage me to slow down, honestly, it's, it's no problem. Just watch, watch my pace because I can be quite quick when I get uh, passionate. Okay, right, let's go. Let's get into the good stuff. Um, the first thing is that I want, I want to ground us and root us in the understanding of what it is to have any type of anxiety or nervous system activation. So when we talk about nervous system activation, we're talking about anything that includes low level anxiety, up to panic and undie disassociation. So we're talking about the full gamut, okay? The full gamut of nervous system activation. And I'll use that word, nervous system activation. So wherever we are, wherever, whenever I'm talking about um, anxiety, fear, panic, disassociation, I'm really speaking to the full spectrum of the experience. Is that okay? Everybody all right with that? So I'm speaking to that experience and I want to anchor and do something that is really profoundly important to me is the understanding of that experience in the human condition. Out of how many, I think there's 70 odd people here tonight, out of all of us here who has experienced at whatever level in that continuum who has experienced anxiety or disassociation and panic? Out of all of these, can you would you be able to raise your hand and say, yes, I've experienced it? Let me know. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. Okay. So, and we're most of us, Michelle, lovely to see you. Uh, good to see you, Michelle. Um, out of all of us that are sitting here today, look at the practitioners among you. Look at who, look at all of us that are raising our hands. Now, why am I asking you to raise your hand? I'm asking you to raise your hand because I want to go back to the fundamental idea and the fundamental understanding of the experience of anxiety, the experience of panic, the experience of disassociation. Because when we're anchored and rooted in that and we've one common goal, then all of this information will make sense. For me, this is the most difficult experience. When we talk about mental health, when we talk about the diagnosis that comes with mental health, when we talk about the emotional problems that somebody can present with, for me, when we understand the pain abject terror, horror, pain that exists when we're persistently and consistently experiencing anything inside that nervous system activation. It is severe, it is difficult, it is life-threatening in some cases. And so in that understanding, in that understanding, this model that I'm about to show you seeks not only to manage it, but to actually heal it. And that might be the difference here. 
And the reason that we move beyond managing it and, and the healing is because we fundamentally understand and can anchor into that experience in that client. Because that client is in severe pain. That client is in severe difficulty. And when we anchor into that, we understand that this model that I'm about to share, we not only offers a way of managing that, but it offers a way to what we call clear and, and heal that. That might sound crazy. That might sound like it's not possible, but there's enough people in this room today to tell you that it is absolutely possible. And I wanna share that possibility with you tonight and over the next four nights as we, as we work together. It's absolutely possible. I know it in me. And I know it in thousands, at this stage, thousands of hours of clinical practice. This is my life's work. And by God, will I go down and shout about it? And I genuinely mean that. We have now, I mean, hundreds of practitioners on the ground getting absolutely amazing results. So when we understand the depth of the pain, we understand the need for the remedy. We understand the need for the healing. We understand the need. So I'm coming at this from a really grounded, solid, rooted place and understanding the client's absolute, in some parts, desperation. And how that's the first thing that we'll talk about. And we'll get there in a wee minute. This workshop is absolutely dedicated for you to understand the component parts of what it looks like to heal. I did that, right? Because it's a diamond. The model that I'm about to share with you is the diamond model. And these are the four component parts of what it is required to actually heal. To manage and heal. And I'm going to share it with you. I, is, so I'm going to share it in detail over the next four nights. And I'm also going to make uh, an invite to you at the end of this. A heartfelt, honest invite to join me in the training program that we, wrote, that we open every four, four times a year. So this, that invite will come on day, on day five. If you're aligned with it, fantastic. If you're not, fantastic too. But I can promise you, by the end of the workshop, you will go away knowing where your clients are. We're going to get really, really deep into this. It's not just a skimming surface and then you're left wondering and wondering. You, you, you know, you're left open and you're left not knowing the finer detail. I'm going to give you everything that I can in the time frame I can. And then what we're going to do then is um, invite you to work at a, a deeper level. Should that be a fit? Should that be necessary for you? So... One thing that I want to, I want to jump on the right away is I want to jump on the, the, the difficulty in practicing with anxiety so that we have a commonality here. So if you would type in the chat or let me know if this is resonating, but also if you, because the reason that I ask you to type in the chat is because as practitioners, what often happens is that we often feel that we're not enough. We often feel that we're not doing it right. We often feel that we're not getting it right. We often feel that it's our fault. We often feel that we could do more. We often feel like we're stuck. We often feel all this stuff. And we often blame ourselves. And you think you're the only one. And when I ask questions, I'm asking it so that you can share the commonality and the key practices, the key things that everybody's seeing in practice, because they're all the same. I train this stuff day in and day out. I hear therapists say the same things. And here's what they say. They say, how do I get past storytelling? How do I help somebody who's so connected to the stories, who's so connected to the people, to the places, to the things, and don't seem to be able to understand what is beneath? How do I stop playing whack-a-mole how do I stop playing and whack-a-mole is when you fix one thing, another thing comes up. You work on that and another thing comes up. And it's like that, that arcade game. Does this make sense? Yes, Julia. Brilliant. If it's making sense, just type a wee why in, right? Because it because your other your colleagues, your your contemporaries, yes, look, watch this, right? How do I top that? How do I know if I'll re-traumatize? 
what's how, how, what's too deep when it's too fast how far do you push how long do you how long do you ticket this could i possibly re-traumatize them and leave them in a worse place than they were how do i know if they can co-regulate outside the room i'm not sure what are my boundaries yes all the questions all of the questions what do I do with a client who seems to be getting it, who's nodding in the room, who's telling me that they're doing all the work, but nothing's changing? Is that familiar to anybody? Yes, absolutely. How, what, basically, how do I help an internal processor? How do I work with that? How do I work with somebody who is so absolutely petrified of what's happening in their body, they can't even hold a conversation with me. They can't even be in therapeutic exchange. They can't even be in relationship. They can't even, they can't even meet the fundamentals of therapy, which is basic therapeutic exchange, which is basic contact, basic perception, or not available for that whatsoever. How do I help that client? How do I help the client that's saying, what if, 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 what if? How do I help the client that says, don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do? Is that all sounding familiar? Because isn't that the reality? Isn't that the reality of what we're faced with day in, day out when we're sitting with anxiety, when we're sitting with disassociation, when we're sitting with any of that stuff? That's the reality. How do I stop people blaming everybody and everything else? And how do I get them to lock with them? Yeah. How do I get them to do that? They are the difficulties of treating anxiety. There's many more. If you've got any more, please add to it because I love hearing, hearing um, the nuances of how you're experiencing your own practice. So if you have any more, stick it on there because I'll also want to know that I speak to it over the next four days. How do I have a systemized way of assessing a client and knowing how long it'll take to treat this client? How do I have a systemized way of anybody here, agency work, anybody that are working through the doctors, working through an agency that are given six to 12 sessions and are only getting yes, and are only getting this and Paula and a nightmare to go back and try to get more sessions. Yeah. How do you prove how much you've done? How do you prove how much there is to do? How do you, how do you put that in, a, in a, a formal, practical way that's helpful to both client and, and clinic, clinic? Because that's the biggest difficulty. So we're going to answer all of that, all, all of that inside this summit. Yeah, so whether you join the program or not, that I'm going to invite you on, it doesn't matter. I'm going to answer all of that. And you'll walk away from this week, tangible stuff. That you'll understand that you'll be able to put into your practice right away. Absolutely right away. So has anybody any questions? Anybody any questions whatsoever? Right. I can ramble on, it's 24, 25 minutes past, but let's get started. Let's get into the four principles. Let's get into the diamond model and what it takes to actually heal. And here are the four principles. So, you know, the diamond models on the, on the pack, on the note pack, isn't it? Can you remember? Yeah, it's there, yeah. Right, okay, so here we go. So here are the four basic principles of um, the treatment of anxiety. And Rachel, you'll be able to see the magic now. I see you with your pen and your paper. <laughs> um, so you'll be able to see the magic now. It's amazing, but when you've been treated by this and you're coming to the training of this, you'll be able to, you'll be able to have these aha moments that'll be really, really good to see. So the first principle is, the first principle is, it's called triggers here, but it's, it's therapeutic exchange. What is being presented? 
Okay, so that's the first principle. There are principles within principles, and we're going to dive deep into the principles within principles. But this is the first principle. What is being presented? What is in the therapeutic exchange? Okay, so we're going to dive into that in a wee minute. The second principle is, is there tolerance of the body? If there is no tolerance of the body, yeah, then we have to create tolerance. We create tolerance by working in the body. Sometimes this tolerance work is life-changing in and of itself. Once we create tolerance, can we work on root cause? So if you think about healing versus managing, right? If you think about the two principles, healing versus managing, healing versus managing. When we look at what is being presented and we look at the top end of this diamond, this is fundamentally healing or fundamentally uh, management. As you're working here, as you learn what these principles are and you learn, learn how to work with these principles, you're fundamentally creating what I would like to understand is the management of nervous system activation. The minute that you start to work here and recause inside the core threats and key threats, and we'll explain them as we move, you're starting to create a difference. You're starting to change the actual root cause of the anxiety itself. You're starting to work in healing. Now, it is up to your client and it's your client's prerogative at what, el what stage of the uh, model they work on. Do they work at the top end of the model, the upper end of the diamond, or are they going to work on root cause? What I will say to you is, there is absolutely no work that can be done at root cause level unless this stable diamond is done. And I will explain why as we, pro as we go forward. There can be no, absolutely no work that is done. We had a wonderful example today in training and I'll just I'll relay that um, from a client's perspective. In training today, we had a, a client case um, study that was, was brought. And there was a client who came, she was very young, and she came to therapy for what do one of the practitioners. And she was so intolerant of her physical body everybody with me she was so intolerant of her physical body she could not be in therapeutic exchange i.e she could not be in conversation she could not be understood she couldn't relay the triggers she couldn't relay the the story she could, she was just absolutely trapped outside any relationship because she was so afraid of the symptoms in her body. Once those symptoms was tolerated through series of exercises, and this will all make sense to you as we move, she was able to be in therapeutic exchange. Once she was able to be in therapeutic exchange, she was able to not only just be in regulation of her symptoms, she was able to be in sovereignty and agency of her symptoms. Yeah. Once she was in sovereignty and agency of her symptoms, then she could deepen into root cause. And the therapeutic exchange, the therapeutic relationship was deepened by it all. Does that make sense, Steve? That we gear that presented herself to therapy was not ready for root cause. She was not ready for a deepened relationship. The only thing that she needed was a management of her physical symptoms in that moment. And this is what I hope you will find at the end of this. You will be able to assess and work directly with that. Does that make sense to everybody? Give me a nod of the head if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Michelle, Paula, yeah, Sean, Susan, that makes sense? Okay, so let's start to get under the detail. So this is the first principle that we're going to work on here. Okay, so the first thing that I want to ask you as we, I have loads of notes, but I'll ne I never remember them. So 
what do we see? Make sure I'm moving through it, right? Okay, so the first principle that we're looking at is this therapeutic exchange. So when a client comes in, right, I'm going to ask you a few questions that I want you to ask yourselves. You're going to be scanning for your clients, right? You're scan thinking about them. So just take this slowly. What is, what is the presenting issue? Right? Now, what is the presenting issue? And what is your client's intention? This is so important, right? Now, as we deepen under the principles within principle one, this will, be, this will make sense to you. For a lot of our clients, just, as an, just give me an M of its manage or, or an H of its heel, out of interest, right? How many of your clients are coming to actually just manage? Give me an M and give me a percentage, just manage. Not heal root cause, not deepen, just manage. How about percentage? 90% are coming to manage. 50, yeah. All right, and are they first time clients? Yeah. How many of your clients have been around the block? How many of your clients are exhausted? How many of your clients are ready to heal? All. Yes, Beth. <laughs> All. Right. So you're starting to see the difference. Yeah, we're starting to see the difference in those that want to manage and the difference in those, those want to heal. Because you see the people that are managing, they're about five years away from coming back. They say, no, I'm done. I need to get rid of this. Because that's the cycle. Some people show up with anxiety for the first time and are like, I am not tolerating this, so get rid of it. And they don't have to be managing it for years or years or years. They're like, no, this is intolerable to me. You may get rid of this. Now write for the anomachnomy. I'm a no-nonsense. I am not managing this. I have been around the block. I, people are telling me how to manage it. Was that your experience, Fidelma? Um, yeah, that was my experience. Um, which is a real, it's a real hope and despair cycle. It's exhausting. Absolutely. Um, and really adds to the whole fear of it as well. Absolutely. But, but some people actually just want you to take the symptoms away and, and don't want to get into anything deeper, which is fine and their prerogative. And then there's people like you, for now, was that was the first time you'd felt anxiety. So you were like, no, I'm not having this. I yeah. want that. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. So, so that becomes a really important question for you because that will depend on how, how deep you're going to get under this model. Remember, mm -hmm. we did the top end of the diamond and then we did the bottom end of the diamond. Does that make sense to you? Yes. So we did the top end of the diamond, which is management, and the bottom end of the diamond, which is healing. You don't, we don't have the right to dictate. We follow the client's intention. We follow the client's need. Some clients will show up like Fidelma is saying, we anxiety for the first time and saying, no, 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 I'm not having it. I want to heal. And some clients will be like, get me in and get me out and just help me kind of settle this and I'm not ready because their circumstances, maybe their financial circumstances aren't, you know, aren't there to be able to, to be able to, they stay longer, they elongate longer. Maybe their maybe their world around them isn't isn't substantial enough in order to do deeper work. But this model and this understanding of what is presented will help you decipher and also help you segment what needs done and how it needs done and in what order it needs done. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's your that's the first principle of what is being presented. I want you to get really clear and I want you to get really clear with your client, what they want. Because as Fidelma said, there are some people who have been around the block, who've been in and out, up and down, tried everything, are actually in an okay regulatory place, but want it healed, want it gone. Yeah. 
So then let's talk about what's presented. You know, for some people, for some people, they have a, they have, they are completely and utterly dysregulated. What does it mean to be dysregulated? It means to be outside your window of tolerance on a continuous basis. It means to be so dysregulated, you're either experiencing, excuse me, panic attacks, anxiety, lower level anxiety attacks, possibly in disassociation, possibly in that loop. But they're, that's their experience. They're, they're not in regulation. They don't have this kind of soft um, regulation style where they're activated. Because what we're talk, when we talk about healing anxiety, we're not talking about a full frontal lobotomy. We're not taking the fear centers out. We're not, we're not taking away neuroception. We're not, what we're talking about when we talk about healing is we're talking about removing the core and key threats that are creating that dysregulation. We're not saying to a client, you're never going to feel fear again, or you're never going to feel anxiety. You're never going to feel it around this presenting issue that you're coming in for. And anytime you feel this regulation you'll be inside a good level of a window of tolerance so you'll not get dysregulated where you're right outside and on panic and disassociation how many of your clients would buy that because that's what that's what healing anxiety looks like it's healing anxiety and removal of anxiety are two separate things you know you don't remove anxiety you don't because that's the system that's the human condition but what we can do is take away the root cause of this anxiety that's causing so much dysregulation. And I, that's, why, that's why we are really sought after practitioners. That's why all the guys that are training cannot take anybody else. They are the doors closed because they're because that's the offer. The offer is for those that want to do healing. The offer is there. And I know it might sound crazy. I know you're coming to this thinking, I've never managed that myself. I've never heard anybody else talk about that. But that's the one thing that differentiates us and differentiates this program. So in order to get there, what do we have to do? So when the client is presenting, we have to understand what they're looking for as a healing or management. And we differentiate between that grant. The next thing I want you to think about, and this is in your notepad, what stage of process is your client at? This is exceptionally important. Who are my, apart from Bev, I think Bev, are you person-centered, Bev? I can't remember. Who are my person-centered fellows? Yes, Brita. Yes, Susan, right? So stage of process is not new to you, right? So forgive me if I'm teaching the rest of these to suck eggs, but let's go through stages of process. So stages of process as talked about by, um, good to see you, George. We you see you now, good to see you. Um, stages of process as denoted by Kari Rogers. Let's, let's put a, a wee twist on that. So are your clients coming, are your clients mandated to be with you? I.e., are they coming through a program? Are they coming through the court system? Are they coming through some sort? Are they mandated in some way? Anybody's clients mandated and don't want to be there, but have to be there. And don't see the problem in any of it. Give me, let me know in the chat if that's the case. So we would, that would be kind of talk about zero level of process. Some, but not all, Crystal. Yeah, yeah, private, good, Bev. Um, so, we're understanding what stage of process your clients present at. Low level process, zero. I don't have a problem. I have to be here, so get on with. Yeah. Donna, absolutely. Works in prison, lots of men to engage duty parole and probation requests. And that's tough because that's low level process. That's, that's a shrug of the shoulders. That's I have to be here, but I'm not going to do any work. Stage one, stage two higher level than that I have a problem but it's everybody else many bodies working with that low level process not available to their emotional content at all everything is external everything is coming from the external so give me a give me a, a two of anybody's in that process yes crystal 
So you're on low, some of your clients are in low level process there, which means they're not available to their inner world. They're not available to what's happening within them. They're not available to anything with them. I've got a problem, but it's everybody else. Give me a two if your work, uh, brilliant, Beth. Three is slightly more than that, doesn't it? Three is I've got a problem. It might be me, but I'm not really sure yet. But I'm moving in and out of it being them or moving in and out of it being the boss. Think about this in relation to anxiety. If that boss doesn't show up the way they did, then I wouldn't feel the way I do. Yeah. If my son wasn't doing A, B and C, I wouldn't feel the way I do. Every time I go onto my home place, I feel anxiety. It's that place. Yeah. Is everybody seeing where the stage of process can be inside the presenting issues? These are the narratives. These are the stories. Everything's external. Three is... It might be me, but I'm not sure, but I think I would rather blame them. I think I'd rather be at about this place, this person, this thing. And there's where the client gets stuck in story. Lower level process, not available to their inner world, everything external. I can feel this activation. I don't understand the activation, but I think they're causing it. I think it's this person. Okay, maybe it's me. I'm not sure. Stage four, three, stage four, right? Stage four is I've got a problem. I'm activated. I'm understanding this activation. I think it might be something in me, but I'm slowly being available to the, the material within me. I'm not fully there yet, but I'm certainly not searching outside myself for the answers. I'm exploring gently inside. Anybody got clients working with themselves, working with these feelings inside themselves, working with this understanding of themselves as, as they're triggered? Four, brilliant, Bernadette. Yes, brilliant. Yes. And you might have loads. You might have two and a three and a four. And you, no, it is never helpful to have a whole group of two-stage of process. You'll be pulling your hair out of working with anxiety. It'll be exhausting for you as the therapist absolutely mind-blowingly exhausting because you're trying to move a whole cohort of people through a stage of process and that's exhausting so hopefully brilliant Armandy. stage four stage five stage six and stage seven there's a lot more fluidity right yes bev you've got a few that you've worked up the stages congratulations you would think you were trained brilliant so this is exactly what, you know, this fluidity of process, right? Stage one, stage two, stage three, being able to understand what level of process your clients are coming in at. Because see if they're coming in at the lower ends of process, they're locked out of their body, they're locked out of their, they're locked out of their awareness. And getting them out of story is impossible. So now what I want you to start doing is thinking about your client's process, thinking about taking out your, your client roster, taking out how many clients you have and go down them and start literally just search, just say what stage of process are they at? So because in your mind, you'll then understand what is being presented and how much of what we call that as red herons. That is all smokescreen material. Because there's a body of stuff underneath that you're not get that we can't access because of their low stage of process. So the next thing, so sorry, just to, to finish that, five, six, and seven is a more fluid level of process. So it's a more I, here's how I feel. I'll give you an example of that. I have done this training. I don't know how many times. I teach this stuff every single week without fail, right? I could stand, look, you could put me in a street corner, switch me on and it would just come out of me, right? This I know, this I am rock solidly sure. See for an hour before I come on to this stuff, I start to get activated. I start to get, I start to get a, a butt jittery. I start to pray that a few wee faces that I know will show up and, and make me feel a wee bit better about the material, right? So I start to get activated at some level 
swell within the window of tolerance, but I start to get activated and it's difficult. What has that got to do with my stage of process? One, I understand the activation. I understand that I'm about to come and present my absolute life's work to you. I understand that I am fighting against the grain of what's out there. I understand that, right? I understand that I am about to put my head on the chopping board and go against everything that you've been trained, go against everything that you possibly understand. And I get activated, I get nervous, but I understand that. I can regulate that in a high level of process. So I can wor work that out, I understand. I don't have to search for it, I don't have to wonder. I, don't, I know, and I know the minute I get going, it'll flow and I'll be all right. But again, back to all the stuff that we said, healing anxiety is not about not having it. It's about creating these short windows of tolerance, exactly knowing where it's from, what it's about, and being able to regulate ourselves in it. Does that make sense? So these higher levels of process are where people can say to you, exactly just as I've done. I'm activated, I'm inside my window of tolerance, but here's what it is. Here's where it's coming from, here's the, here's the, and the more you work the client through the model, the higher level of process, All right? Now, next question. What are your client's levels of introspection? This is so massive. Oh my God, this is a game changer, right? See, when you assess this in your clients, is there anybody as excited as me, right? I'm wild excited because it's really brilliant stuff. What are your client's levels of introspection? Have you ever asked yourself that question? What does that mean, introspection? The facets of introspection are fascinating. The facets of interception. Facets of interception are when a client is able to understand the nuanced experience within. When they're able to decipher, ask yourself this question, can my client decipher between what is physical, what is emotional, what is somatic, what is hormonal, what is intuition? All of these different facets of an inner experience, can my client differentiate? One of the key ways to know your client can or can't is when you're, how many of your clients are coming in and they're saying, I go into panic or I go into disassociation and it just happens. How many of your clients say that? There's no warning, there's no, it just happens. You see that, Michelle? Yeah. Low levels of interception. Many, brilliant Bernadette. Low levels of interception. If it comes out of nowhere, if they have no scooby-doo, if it just hits them, if it just arises, then they were talking about low levels of interception. All of your new starter clients, yes, Bev, and then as you work them through the process, this gets sharper and cleaner and clearer. And for clients with low level stage of process, low level interception, this stuff can hit them at. So who do they not trust? Themselves. They don't trust the world and they don't trust themselves because they have no idea where this stuff comes from. Is everybody following that? So what levels of interception does your client have? No good, bad, or ugly. What's, what's it look like? Is it like zero? Have they good level? Anybody here work on my clients have good levels of interception? They can sense a panic attack starting or sense something beginning. Have they done enough work in their body? Have they done enough embodied work? Some brilliant crystal. Yes, some fantastic. So they have better levels. Yes, bear that. Some and yeah, brilliant. Most, but not all, brilliant. So there's work in interception. Yeah, anybody here that has suffered from anxiety attacks be prior to being trained or suffered from disassociation prior to be trained will know what that's like. And then you get awareness, don't you? And then the awareness changes the regulation in it. And this is what we're assessing for our clients. We're assessing their levels of interception. 
their level stage of process. And we're now going to assess their levels of metacognition. Yes, it is a new life. It's a completely new life. Sorry, prior to that, maybe think about something, Bev. Thank you. When a client, see for some of our most traumatized clients, and I'd like to see from your, your comments, are some of our most traumatized clients are actually disunified, which means that they have cut off their interception that they're, they have no psycho, they have psychosomatic, what we call an EM, psychosomatic disunity. That it's not safe to be in the body. It's not safe to be aware of feelings. It's not safe to be aware of sensations. So they stay in their heads. How many of your clients would you say have psychosomatic disunity? You a lot, Susan? Not even there? Yeah. Lots. Yeah. You see, if you're saying yes, yes, yes to all of this, this is why treatment of anxiety is a nightmare. Because these are all the factors that block deepening. These are all the factors that block awareness of what's happening around them. These are all the factors that block them out of control. These are all the factors that block them to sovereignty and agency. Do you see this? Does everybody see this? Just give me a wee nod. Is this making sense? Right. Okay. Brand. Yes, Susan. I mean, that's it's it, it's nearly it's nearly a given that there's psychosomatic disunity where there's sexual abuse. Cannot be any other way. It has to be that way. Survival has to be that way. Survival has to be from here up. It cannot be connected to the body at all. So the levels of interception really poor, levels of psychosomatic unity really poor. Has to be, yeah. Yeah. Bev saying most clients are from failed therapies that went too fast and no self-awareness and integration first. Yeah, absolutely. So what we're talking about here is, we're to, remember with the principle that we talked about earlier when we said, you know, is it too far, too fast? Is it, am I pushing too hard? Am I understanding root cause? Am I, am I, is the client moving too far, too fast? Am I questioning too far, too fast? Am I at the risk of re-traumatizing here? Whenever we're not on awareness of psychosomatic unity and the reason that psychosomatic unity exists is protection. So we don't push past it. We have to work very diligently and very quiet, very kind of carefully with it. And also within the client's consent. We don't do that. We don't do anything to the client that the client doesn't lead us on. So these are the factors that block us out of getting anywhere with anxiety. And if we're not assessing it, if we're not assessing it, then we're doing ourselves a huge disservice when we're doing the client because we're skipping parts of the process where the client cannot. It's not an unwillingness. Do you, do you see that it's not an unwillingness? People say, um, you know, it's self-sabotage. Self -sabotage. If you don't like bad language, cover your ears. Bullshit. It's not. There is an entire process going on within the human condition that's protecting and preparing and solving and soothing and predicting and trying to keep the client safe. We have to work and understand that prior to, it's kind of like pre-therapy. So this is kind of the assessment of pre-therapy before we would do anything else. And there's a body of work there. Is that okay? See the where I lose me? See where I lose my mind? Right, okay. Uh, conscious of time so the next one then is levels of metacognition now thinking about our thinking being an awareness of what our thoughts are being an awareness of what's happening in our head if you don't have good metacognition then you're going to blame you're going to point outwards because this feeling didn't come from you it came from that Came from that person, came from that place, came from that thing. And so metacognition becomes an incredibly important piece of the puzzle. 
Yeah. Uh, it is. It's a, a really important. You gain the client's trust. It's slow. It is slow, but I would take slow over unsafe any day. Absolutely. And the client will too. The only problem is, is whenever you, whenever you're, you're working inside a short frame time, that is, becomes a difficulty for sure. Caroline, my daughter was bullied terribly at school, the age of 12, suffered awful anxiety and depression. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And, and hopefully this will help you understand what's happening for her and, and maybe help her, Caroline. So that is to say, these are the presenting issues and nothing has been presented. There is nothing tangible here that we would be working with, even as this is presented. Does that make sense? And so we're assessing, I want you to assess, assess the stage of process, their introspection, their metacognition. I want you to assess how well, how much unity there is. And I want you to assess one last thing. And this is what we call the fear of the fear. Everybody understands the fear of fear. This is what we call intolerance A inside the, inside the diamond model. When the client is so shut down to their own physical, so they're so petrified of the experience in their and this isn't the same as emotions. When they're so petrified by the physical symptoms of anxiety, disassociation. So when I say nervous system activation, they're so petrified by the symptoms of nervous system activation, then that's where they're locked out of exchange. That was that example that I gave earlier. They're so petrified by what their body may do or will do to them that they're locked out of any exchange. They're locked out of even any levels of communication, any under, even if you psychoeducate on introspection would be a block. Now these, why do we assess this? Because this will tell us our next steps. This will tell us what work is to be done first. And if these are all low level guys, right? If this is all low level stage of process, low level introspection, zero psychoagic, zero uh, psychosomatic unity, zero metacognition, then we have a body of work to do before we would ever begin to excavate root cause. We have a body of regulation work. We have a body of reunification work. We have a body of safety work. We have a body of work to do before anything else is done. Does that make sense? So that was principle one. All right, principle two, we'll move through them really quickly. When you understand principle two, again, it's within the, what is being presented. Principle two, we're gonna get in the really heavily tomorrow night. But it, it's enough to say inside understanding all of these, all of the, these four principles, enough to say that we're still, if you remember the diamond model, we're still at that, that other end. We're still in therapeutic exchange here, all right? So the mind's functions, I know Brita, you roll in your eyes at this stage. Um, Brita's in our, our clearing program. She's sick listening to me talking about mind's functions rolling them eyes, breathing, giving out to me. Um, the mind's functions is this. To scan for threat. That's not all of the mind's functions, part of it. Scan for threat. And that threat that's, that the mind is scanning for is subconscious. It's neuroception. So it's not available to the conscious awareness. It's just kind of like we pieces of awareness that sit in the shoulder and watch. Now that neuroception will warn the body. Is everybody with me? Now when that neuroception warns the body, then the mind has to make sense of what the body is warned about. Everybody follow me? So when the mind is trying to make sense of what the warning in the body is about, it'll blame the first thing it gets its hands on. It'll identify, yeah, it'll predict, it'll gather information, and this information will be brought as a presenting issue to therapy. Yeah, 
And because the mind is so darn good, you see, I watched, watched my P's and Q's there. Because it's so darn good at solving, soothing, predicting, analyzing, it gets it so badly wrong. It gets the reason for this in the body so badly wrong and it uses the mind itself to solve and soothe and predict and check and, and assess and confirm. And, and that is one of the, the biggest factor in presenting issue. Is that the mind has made up its mind of why we are in anxiety. Why we are in disassociation, why we're in panic. It mind has made up its mind and that mind has sometimes got it wrong, not always, but on a lot of the occasions they get it wrong. And what happens is their prediction, we call them prediction thoughts, prediction thoughts, the what if thoughts, the protection thoughts emanate from the mind so the mind produces, and I don't want to get too deep into it, right? Because it is mind blowing to even think about it. But the mind produces these thoughts that are fundamentally ways in which the, the mind understands the threat to be. And then it tells the system, you know, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if this happens? What if that happens? What? But it's all to do with the threat that it thinks that it has. And it does this other uh uh, protection thoughts don't do 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 that don't do that come back from that don't do that don't go on the plane don't go don't go to your sister's birthday party don't you know don't take that promotion don't don't do these are all protection thoughts and prediction thoughts and these are what we understand as the smoke screen of the presenting issues if you're working on those thoughts without checking the root cause, or, and it's not root cause, without, without doing deepening work, you're going to play whack-a-mole. And the client is going to attach themselves to what they think is the problem, do six weeks of work, and knock on the back door, because it's going to be a revolving door. Does that make sense? We have inherent in every one of us a threat system. And that threat system tries to warn us. What we've been taught is to discourage that threat system, to meet it where it's at. So I'll give you an example. So where a client comes in, I'm always using the boss as an example because it's the easiest, right? Where the client comes in, and they say that the boss, they've got a new boss, and this new boss is a, um, a, a controller. He's a controlling personality. Yeah. And this client talks about the boss's controlling nature and the fact that he can call people out on a one, that he can call you in two seconds, and he can call people out in front of other people. And the client talks about the boss being the problem. And I don't want, you know, what if he calls me? What if I get that phone call? What if he calls me out in front of everybody else? What if, what if, what if? Don't go to work. Maybe I should look for another job. Maybe I should, right? Is everybody following me? And you work at that level. You work at that level of presentation. Because the client is blocked in their body, they're blocked in their neuroception, they're blocked to understanding what lies beneath. And if we work in those, even if the client is absolutely convinced this is the problem, if we work at those levels, we are just putting a wee sticky plaster on the presenting issue and we're not deepening. Now, the reason that we could not also not be deepening is because the client is blocked out of deepening because the previous work hasn't, or the work that we've talked about hasn't been done. Does everybody know I'm working while fast? So what are we taught to do? We're taught to, taught to try and fix the presentation issue. And some of that fixing, and I've seen this, I've seen the backlash of this, some of that fixing is to discredit the 
threat thoughts? Is it real? What's your evidence? Does that make sense to you? So do you discredit that thought? Do you diminish that thought? Let's stay in the same example of the boss. If the root cause of that client's fear is the fear of humiliation, that it was experienced as a child while being bullied. If the root cause of that humiliation was, was childhood bullying and the experience of childhood bullying was so devastating to that client that they went on the disassociation in the times that they were humiliated, which of which was many, but that isn't available to the client's awareness. Their levels of process are low their metacognition is low, their levels of disunity are high. They're not available to their memory. They're not available to those trauma incidents. And the only thing that they can think is causing this problem is that boss. It is perfectly conceivable that that boss would cause anybody because of his nature, would cause anybody regulation. So we spend about a time talking about how the body acts and the false fear and how the FFS system can go off when it's not supposed to go off and how, you, you know, there's no tiger at the front door. I can tell you this, that creates, that creates a minefield of mistrust in clients. When we, when we don't, and what I'm saying is that the stuff is a, a smoke screen but it's a beautiful smoke screen because it's the beginning of deepening, using it to deepen. So we never in this model discredit that is brought. We understand it's the beginning of something. We understand that it is this, the, you know, like the top of a thread that you're about to pull out. It's the top of something. The mind has given us some clues, but it's not the problem. We don't discredit it, nor do we treat it, but we work in understanding what might lie beneath it. So that's principle two. What is presented and, un and being able to understand what is before being presented and we're going to get into the nitty gritty of that tomorrow night is everybody all right with that we're going to work on the two particular thoughts and and what you do with them and i'm going to help you as much as i can when the client presents to work with that is that everybody all right with that so we the first module that i teach in this is called the threat system and it's we get really really detailed and the understanding what the mind's functions are what the mind is doing how the mind is picking up the threat what we also understand is that the mind could pick up the threat in the body. And so we understand that as well inside these principles. So let me move on to principle three. In my notes, okay. Principle three is we've moved across now to the here, right? So we, one and two are here. And principle three is here and here, right? So, and this is the last principle. So I'm going to be talking between these two places here. Oh, where am I? Okay. So principle three is when we understand the difference between agency, sovereignty, and regulation. Okay. So Whilst the regulation of anxiety or disassociation is really, 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 really important, and it's a principle that we teach, it is not the only way to get a client and the sovereignty and agency. And there is a fundamental difference between regulation and agency. So regulation would be where you move into panic and you can regulate yourself quite quickly. Is everybody all right with that principle of regulation? How many of these here have been taught regulation techniques? Let me know in the chat. How many of you know regulation techniques? Armandy, for sure. Yeah, Bev, 
Just like, I would like as many of each. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, good. Yes, Armandy. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Okay, so regulation is incredibly important, right? But sovereignty changes the game. Now, what is the difference between regulation and sovereignty? Regulation, in my understanding, is when a client can, can go up and under panic or go under disassociation, but regulate themselves back in the, in the semi-regulated state or a regulated state quick enough. They go under panic and they go under disassociation. They are triggered, but they have more understanding and they have more understand, they have more trust in themselves, they regulate themselves after it. Is that fair enough? Yeah, is that fair enough in terms of regulation? Yeah. Dorsal tonin exercises, um, grounding exercises, all of these red and there's nothing wrong with them. They are brilliant and we use them and we and they're built and they are programs. But what we and what I have found and what I understood is that, and this is going to this is going to be so difficult, but we'll get to it in day three, right? Is that there is an interplay between the body and the mind that happens. There is this interplay, this authentic and individualized interplay that happens uniquely for each and every single human being that means that every single human being has an anxiety map. Now, I have never, and the guys will tell you, Brita, uh, Fidelma, who else is here has done the training. I have never seen the same anxiety map. Now, what's an anxiety map? An anxiety map is the way that the body moves and the anxiety or disassociation and the nervous system. It's the, the unique physical symptoms, right? And it's the way in which the mind interacts with each physical symptom in a particular way with a particular meaning that pertains to that particular client's frame of reference. Is everybody following me? That creates the building symptoms. Now, sovereignty is where you change all of that meaning and that you don't have a building symptoms. So there is nothing to regulate. I know it sounds like woo woo. I know it sounds like cannot be done. I know it sounds crazy. Is there anybody here that is willing to testify? Anybody willing to put their hand up and say, because it's really hard to get your head around as a, it's really hard to get your head around as a practitioner that that is a possibility. But it's absolutely true. Isn't that right? I'm looking at two ladies that know exactly that it's right. Yes, Diane, you can testify. Brilliant. Yeah. Really important. Brilliant. So Rachel's saying totally. That fair, Rachel. Yeah. Yeah. Because that has been their experience. And it's it's profound. It's profoundly different. It's a game changer, right? And it's not some sort of kind of look, we've gathered evidence for this. We have gathered hours and hours of evidence for this, clinical hours of evidence for this that there is a, an interplay that absolutely happens between the mind and the body that is particular to the client's frame of reference and gives meaning and builds the symptoms. Now, what that means is that we can have these, yes, Tracy, I forgot you were there actually, Tracy, yes. So Tracy went through the model herself as a, um, as a therapist, she went through the model herself with one of our therapists and then came back to train on the model because it was that significant. So look, I'm not trying to sell you something, I'm just trying to convince you, right? That, that there is a way to gain sovereignty that's different from a way to gain a regulation. And sovereignty is whenever we get into the um, maps and what we call the maps and patterns. 
Now, we tiny secret, I'm really careful about time. Maps and patterns. So the anxiety map, guess what you have to have for your anxiety map? You have to have metacognition. So when you're building a map for a client, you're working on their metacognition. When you're building a map, you're working on their introspection. When you're building a map, you're working on their, on their, um, you're working on their psychosomatic unity. When you're building a map, that one tool, that one mapping tool creates all of, changes the stage of process. That's why you saw people saying on the sidelines, oh, I've moved my clients down the stage of process. Because what we call maps and patterns, and I'll show you in the diamond model, what we call maps and patterns is this ability to build metacognition, strengthen metacognition, the build interception, the build levels of awareness in stage of process. And what, when you do that and you create that sovereignty, guess what happens? What do you see this? You create tolerance. You create full tolerance of not only the body, but all of the triggers. When you do that maps and patterns, you create tolerance. And when you create tolerance, you create more space for therapeutic exchange. Why do you create tolerance? Because you create sovereign. When you do that, alongside your regulation tools, you've ticked the box of managing and managing if really, really well. Now, the fourth and final principle at the client's request. As led and directed by the client is to understand the root cause. We just give an example there of the boss. We give an example of the boss that is the trigger. And now what we're doing here, because there's a tolerance, because there's no fear, because there's metacognition, because we've done all of that here, now there is a willingness, a safety in the client. Not only a safety just from regulation, but there's sovereignty and agency and a trust in the client's therapeutic process, a trust in you not to push too far too fast, a tolerance in them for the process itself and a tolerance of their body. Now the client can begin to deepen beyond the story. Now the client can begin deepen beyond the red herons, beyond the smoke screen that is presented. Now the client can tolerate the relationship and tolerate the excavation. Because you would be bringing that client in principle four back to the feelings of humiliation that were experienced as a child. Back to the traumatized experience of that young dear young fella that every part of their neuroception every part of their threat system had been warning them about but had picked it up in the boss had picked it up in confrontation had picked it up had picked it up a million million different ways how many ways if that's the key threat if that's the and they're Look, I'm not going to get too, well, day four will do that, right? You just want to speak to, the, speak to the process, the way these come together, and then we'll get into the detail of it. But I want to ask you this question, and we'll do this again. How many, if you look at that root cause, right? If you think about the way the mind works, how many ways would the neuroception pick up the fear of humiliation? How many ways would the mind warn against the fear of humiliation? How many ways would the mind try to solve humiliation? How many ways would, do you understand now what the presenting issues and how they become and common and common and common like that? How many, if the client is low levels of interception, if the client is low levels of metacognition, if the client has got all, all of that, what happens? then you're just running in story, you're just running in regurgitation, you're just running the mind's functions, you're just running in the client staying ab in, up here. And that's why we have a revolving door when it comes to anxiety.
It is fundamentally why we have this revolving door situation. Because we're not treating at the right level and we're not being led by the client's intentions. They are the four fronts of us. I've kept these long enough. Okay. So anybody, any questions? The one there. Brilliant, Crystal. Sorry for keeping you. I'm so sorry for keeping you. Bazillion, what's that remedy? And was that you, Fidelma? What was that? Tell me what that is. No, what was that? No. Sorry. Ah. <laughs> You're all right. You're all right, Armand. I'll be back to you in a wee minute. You said we'll you never forget that. What was that? Oh, I'll never forget that moment of the the sovereignty in the body. That was an unbelievable moment for me. I'll never forget it. Oh, it was class. And because then I knew that healing was possible after running and running and running. It was an incredible feeling. Still, still love it. <laughs> but that's a really interesting comment, right? Because the mm. moment that you realized you could get in sovereignty was the moment that gave you hope for healing. Oh, I, I, I knew then I was like, this is that, this is, this is going to be healed. <laughs> but, and but after the exhaustion of running for, for help, like it's an unbelievable moment. It really is. Especially when you're cycling and circling for you that you wanted to heal. Oh, and, and every solution under the sun being fired under you. Serious. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. So, but that's a really important thing, I think, to say, you know, once you sovereignty, then healing was, I'm going there, that's it. Yeah, and you, you, you knew it was possible, class. Brilliant. Thanks, Shama. Thanks, Fidel, thank you. Sorry, Armandy, what were you going to say? I was just going to explain bazillion is a hyperperbole of, like, so many, because you were asking how many Sorry. different ways, can, I'm like, yeah, bazillion, that's all. <laughs> Not important. Yeah. Sorry, I read it out of context. That's what happened. Yes, understand bazillion now. A bazillion ways. Absolutely. Okay, so um, tomorrow night we're going to get... We're, um, the question is, how do you help a client who's blocked to connect? There's a million... Day two, day... What day is it? Day one, day two. Day three, we'll get into the detail of that um, for sure. I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Um, okay, fantastic. So. Tomorrow, we're going to look at particularly the two factors, the two red herrings that present themselves. We're going to get into the detail of that. That's the mind's functions. And the particularly two anxiety thoughts that often end up in the presentation stages. And, and, and being able to see beyond that, being able to see beneath that, and understanding when not to work in that, and when they, when they, when they understand how to get beyond it. So that's what we're going to do tomorrow night. Is that all right? That, is that okay? And that question on um, connecting, we will do day three because that's a very detailed uh, question about, there's a body of work. Shahila, I think your name is. There's a body of work to do there. Okay, all right, thank you. Thanks so much. See you all, okay, see you all for more for tomorrow night. And um, we'll do day two tomorrow night. And remember, the replay is available in the morning. Happy enough? All right, Leona. Leona, any questions on Facebook? Can we sign off? No, it's all quiet on Facebook. All good. Okay. Fantastic. All right. See you later. All right, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye, Susan. Thanks. Thanks, Paula and Susan and Rachel and all the gears that were good to me and nodding along and playing, helping me feel like I had a wee audience that was sitting in front of me instead of sitting looking at a computer. Thank you for your help and support tonight. Take care and see you next week. I don't know, no problem. Just get her to send her the link for the sign up. I'm sure we can send it to your email. That's no problem whatsoever, Donna. No problem whatsoever. All right, take care. All right, everybody. Bye, bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye.